Hey Optomancers, Chris here. So we've recently had the Explorer's Guide to Wield Amount now released for 5th edition. That has given us two new types of wizard. Those are the Graviturgy and the Chronergy schools of magic. These both relate to a new kind of magic that is called Dunamancy. Now Dunamancy is not necessarily available to anyone except for these two types of wizards. Uh, according to the book, Dunamancy spells are readily available to the wizard subclasses in this chapter and should not simply be added to the full spell list of other spellcasting classes. Now it says other spellcasting classes, which means certainly clerics or bards or sorcerers. Uh, what it doesn't say specifically is whether we can add it to other subclasses of wizard. And if we read the book, we discover that wizards of other subclasses through espionage have gained access to some of these spells. So as a dungeon master, you may wish to provide opportunity to learn these spells, even for wizards not of those subclasses. Of course, if you are a dungeon master of a campaign that doesn't exist in the campaign world of Weld Them Out, uh, then you might want to allow these spells just to create a little more variety of magic, because there are some interesting ideas here. Now what we see are a list of spells that go right from cantrips to ninth level spells. Uh, so what I want to do today is take a look at those spells and discuss how good I think they are using my normal ranking system. So if I rank it red, I don't think it's very good. If I rank it orange, I think it's probably a little too circumstantial. If I rank it purple, I think it's okay. And if I rank it green, I think it's good. And if I rank it blue, I think it's really good. So let's go over the Dunamancy spells. Let's get started. So we have one new cantrip in this book, and that cantrip is called Sapping Sting. Now this is an attack cantrip that is going to provide a constitution saving throw. So there's no to hit roll, and if they make their constitution saving throw, nothing happens. If they fail their constitution saving throw, they're going to take 1d4 points of necrotic damage, and they're going to fall prone. This spell scales at 5th, 11th, and 17th level, as most attack cantrips do. Uh, and the damage will increase to 2d4, 3d4, and 4d4 at those levels. Now the first thing I'll mention is Constitution Saving Throw, not ideal. Uh, second thing I'm going to mention is that we have a 30-foot range limit here. That's lower than most of these kinds of spells, so that's not ideal either. Now knocking somebody prone as a secondary effect is not bad. In fact, cantrips tend not to have secondary effects, or if they have secondary effects, they're incredibly minor. Now prone is pretty minor too, and it really depends. If you are going and then that enemy is going next, knocking them prone might do nothing. They might simply get up on their turn and act as normal. But if we want to reduce their movement on their turn, or if we're going to have allies who are going to be making melee attacks before that enemy's next turn, then we could be providing them advantage, which could be very useful. Now keep in mind, Prone gives disadvantage on ranged attacks, so whether this is going to be a good spell or not really depends on who your allies are, what order they show up in, in our initiative order, and what order the enemy that we're targeting with this attack ends up in that initiative order as well. And we have to keep in mind that there is a reasonable chance this spell will accomplish nothing, because if that enemy makes that constitution saving throw, nothing happens. I should also point out that the scaling here is bad. This suffers from the same problem that Vicious Mockery suffers from, where we have the base damage really low, but we add a secondary effect. But that secondary effect is not scaling with our level, only the damages, and because those damage dice are smaller, we're getting less scaling than we would with other attack cantrips. So Sapping Sting might be okay at first level, but at 5th level it's not very good. At 11th level it's pretty bad, by 17th level it's pretty terrible. So when it comes to ranking this spell, I would rank it orange. And the reason I would rank it orange is because, circumstantially, this can be a reasonably useful spell at low levels. Because if on our turn we look at our allies, we have melee attackers going up on an initiative order before that enemy will be going again, or reducing that enemy's movement is going to give us a tactical advantage, then Sapping Sting might be a useful use of our action. But by higher levels, prone is nothing 
And so it's really not worth using your action on your turn for a chance to knock an enemy prone. And I should mention, not a great chance. Regardless of what level you are, a d4 damage or 2d4 at 5th, 3d4 at 11th, 4d4 at 17th is not a significant amount of damage to do to an enemy. So potentially a decent spell at lower levels, I don't think a very good spell at higher levels. So potentially a decent spell at lower levels some of the time, and at higher levels I don't think a good spell at all. Now let's talk about our first level spells. The first one I want to talk about is Gift of Alacrity. So this is a first level spell, casting time one minute. The duration is great, eight hours, no concentration. And we can cast this on ourselves, we can cast it on an ally. And when we cast this spell on a willing creature, it's going to get a 1d8 bonus to its initiative rolls over those next eight hours. Now at low levels, I'm not sure that giving up one of your precious spell slots to gain a bonus to initiative is worthwhile. But when we get to higher levels, and those first level spell slots are not such a big investment anymore, getting a 1d8 bonus to every initiative roll over an entire eight hours, it's probably an entire adventuring day, is actually a huge deal. So this is not a spell I'm going to be taking with a first level wizard. It's probably not even a spell I'll be taking with a third level wizard. But by the time I get to 5th level, 7th level, certainly by ninth level, this is a spell I'm definitely going to want on my list uh, because I can be casting it even on multiple party members, no concentration, and we're all getting that bonus to initiative. D8 means about 4.5 on average. That's probably more than our initiative bonus is to begin with. And it's really going to make a difference uh, because when we're talking about tactics, Winning initiative on the first round provides a significant advantage over an enemy uh, because we're getting that chance to control the battlefield, getting the chance to do damage before we get damage taken to us, uh, gives us the jump on our enemy. Initiative is significantly important in Dungeons and Dragons, and if you can give your side that kind of bonus for a relatively low investment, it's definitely worthwhile. Uh, so at low levels, this is too big an investment. But at high levels, this is definitely something I would want on my list, and I would rank it green. The next spell I want to talk about is also a first level spell. It's called Magnify Gravity. This is, I'll just start with, the most powerful spell for its level of all the Dunamancy spells. This is a 60 foot range, 10 foot radius sphere effect. So in terms of area of effect, this is bigger than any area of effect damage spell you can get with first level for a wizard in Dungeons and Dragons. This is bigger than a Burning Hands, this is bigger than a Thunder Wave. So basically we're talking about 12 squares on a battle map compared to 6 squares for a Burning Hands or 9 squares for a Thunder Wave. Now this is going to give a constitution saving throw and on a failed save the creature is going to take 2d8 force damage. Force damage is one of the most reliable kinds of damage you can do in the game. Also on a failed save, its speed is halved to the end of its next turn, so it is a good way to control the battlefield as well. And because this is a ranged spell, we can often cast it on melee enemies, and what it can do then is divide the enemies. So some of them are going to save, some of them aren't. Those that save will be able to move into melee with our party next round. Those that don't save won't have the movement to move into melee with our party next round, Maybe unless they take the dash action, in which case they can't make attacks. So what it's going to do is it's going to divide our enemy in terms of either their placement or their ability to attack. So what we end up with is essentially a spell kind of similar to Thunder Wave, except we're increasing the range on it. Uh, Thunder Wave has to actually occur right next to the caster. This one has a 60-foot range on it and a bigger area of effect for the same amount of damage with potentially an even more reliable damage type hitting the same saving throw. So it's just pretty much straight out better than a Thunder Wave, and significantly so. And Thunder Wave is potentially the best blast spell for first level wizards. So what we've done is we've taken the best blast spell of first level wizards and we've made it significantly better. So this is a very powerful spell for the level. And I would say it basically trumps Thunder Wave. I don't see the point of taking Thunder Wave at all anymore if this spell is available. It's just better. Uh, and I would definitely rank it blue. So now we're going to get into second level spells. Uh, the first spell I want to talk about is Fortune's Favor. 
Uh, so this is a very unique kind of spell because what it'll do is, it, so it's a minute to cast and it lasts for an hour. And essentially what it does is it gives you like a luck point, as in the feat luck that normally gives you three luck points. You basically, with fortune's favor, can give somebody one luck point. Now the way it's worded is uh, unlike the luck feat in that you can't get that super advantage that you sometimes can get when you have disadvantage and then you use a luck point to instead turn it into super advantage. Uh, if you're not aware of that, basically the way luck works is if you make a roll with disadvantage and you use a luck point, you can make an additional roll and then you can choose any of the three d20s that you rolled in order to choose your result. So in fact, having disadvantage and adding a luck point is better than a straight out roll and using a luck point. Uh, this one is worded so that you are either using the luck point you get through the spell or the result of those 2d20 if you rolled with disadvantage or advantage from your regular roll. But still, luck points are incredibly good. They can really help you out, uh, especially on really important rolls like saving throws. Uh, and a one hour duration with no concentration is a pretty good effect for a second level spell. Uh, again, this is not something I would necessarily invest in in low levels. If a second level slot is one of my higher level slots, getting one luck point for one hour is not worth that slot. The other thing is this spell costs 100 gold pieces to cast every time. You have to have a pearl worth 100 gold pieces which the spell casting consumes. So again at low levels I don't want to be spending 100 gold pieces every time I cast one of my second level slots. But once I'm a higher level, and second level isn't one of my higher level slots, and once I have a fair amount of gold that maybe 100 gold pieces isn't a big investment anymore, then this is something I might invest in. Uh, I don't think it is a fantastic spell at any level, but I think it's certainly solid once we get to higher levels. So I'm going to rank it purple because I do think it is a reasonable spell at those higher levels, but again, not something I would be investing in at low levels. The next spell I want to talk about is a movable object. This is also a second level spell. This is a touch spell that lasts for one hour. Once again, there's no concentration on this spell. And what you do is you're going to touch an object. It can't weigh more than 10 pounds and you cause it to be magically fixed in place. So kind of like the effect you would get with say an immovable rod. Now you can move the object normally and creatures you designate can move the object normally. You can also set a password that can suppress the spell. We might use it to create a magical step. We might use it to create a trap in the water if we're on a boat, for example. Uh, definitely, these are circumstantial uses. Also, this spell does use a 25 gold piece component that is consumed on casting. So once again, if we're a third level wizard, that could be a problem. Uh, and as a circumstantial spell, again, not necessarily a spell I want to invest in when I'm third level. But as a higher level wizard, once again, this is something I might want to look at because that 25 gold pieces component isn't going to be a big deal once I get to higher levels. And circumstantially, this is a useful spell. So I would rate this spell orange. Circumstantially, a good spell. The next spell I want to talk about is Wrist Pocket, also a second level spell. This spell is a ritual spell, which means we can cast it without using a spell slot. But its duration is concentration, one hour. So that means when we cast a spell, it's going to limit what other spells we can cast during that time. And what you do is basically you have an object in your hand and you can cause it to vanish. And then when the spell ends, the object will reappear. So this is basically a simplified version of Dromage's instant summons. But there's no concentration on that spell. But this spell doesn't require that expensive material component that Dromage's Instant Summons uses. It's also four levels lower. Uh, so I think that is a reasonable trade here. If we want to smuggle an object in somewhere, uh, then this is the kind of spell we would use. Again, that's something that's going to happen circumstantially. So this is definitely an orange rated spell in that circumstantially it's a useful spell. Not a spell I'm going to be grabbing again at third level, but something I might want on a scroll or I might want in my spell book, especially once we get to a higher level, as circumstances will come up once in a while where it is useful to hide an object that you would be carrying in your hand. So we're going to get into our third level spells here. The first one I want to talk about is Pulse Wave. 
So Pulse Wave is a third level blast spell. It creates a 30 foot cone. Uh, and anyone caught in that 30 foot cone is going to make a constitution saving throw. If they fail the constitution saving throw, they take 66 force damage, or they take half as much damage on a successful save. Then you can make a choice when you cast a spell, and those who fail their save are either pulled 15 feet towards you or pushed 15 feet away from you, depending on the choice you made. Now, a 30 foot cone at third level is not great. That's 21 squares. That's significantly less than we might get from an effect like, say, a fireball. Uh, also, cones are harder to place than spells with range uh, because they have to originate from you. Uh, also, that 66 damage is less than we would expect from a third level spell. We have spells like Fireball, we have spells like Lightning Bolt, and they do more damage than that. 8d6 instead of 66. So this is doing about three quarters of the damage we would expect from a spell of this level. We're trading all those things. So we're trading size, we're trading range, we're trading damage for the secondary effect, which is a push or pull of 15 feet on a failed constitution saving throw. Keep in mind that a Thunder Wave, which is a first level spell, has a push 10 feet effect. So we're not getting much bigger effect than we would get from a first level spell. So it feels like we're giving up a lot here for a pretty minor effect. Pushing 15 feet, pulling 15 feet, these things can be useful once in a while, but do I really want to invest in a blast spell that's going to give me a much worse range, a much worse area of effect, worse damage, and targets a stronger saving throw just for a circumstantial effect that might be useful some of the time? Probably not. So I'm going to rank this spell red because I probably wouldn't recommend this spell, though I don't think it's magnitudes weaker than a fireball. I just think it's weaker enough that I just can't recommend it. Then we get into fourth level spells, and the spell I want to talk about is Gravity Sinkhole. So Gravity Sinkhole has a 120 foot range, which is a good range, has a 20 foot radius sphere of effect, so it's about the size of a fireball, instantaneous effect. Uh, it will target your constitution and saving throw. Notice that a lot of these Dunamancy spells, and I noticed this, tend to target constitution. That's not ideal, I have to say. Now on a failed save, they take 5d10 force damage and they're pulled in a straight line towards the center of the sphere, ending as closest to the center as possible without uh, interfering with somebody else's space. If they make their save, they take half damage and they're not pulled. Now the damage here, 5d10 for a fourth level spell, is definitely not ideal. So we're going to be doing less damage on average than a fireball would do, which is a lower level spell. The only reason we would ever do this spell is for the pushing to the center effect. And on its own, I wouldn't say that's a great effect. But there is the possibility we might be able to combine it with some other effect that maybe some other spellcaster can do. Uh, so if it is a matter of just clustering enemies into a smaller area of effect so that we can hit them with another area of effect spell, then this might be worth the higher level spell and the lower damage than compared to, say, a fireball. So I would say it is a circumstantially and potentially useful spell. So I'm going to rank it orange. Uh, but again, unless you have a plan for how clustering those enemies is going to be of advantage to you, I probably wouldn't recommend this. That's going to bring us into our fifth level spells. And the spell we have at fifth level is Temporal Shunt. This is a reaction spell. And the trigger for this reaction is when we see a creature make an attack roll or start casting a spell. And when we cast a spell, the way it works is the enemy makes a wisdom saving throw. And if they fail their wisdom saving throw, they are thrown into another point in time. So they basically, they disappear and it causes them to automatically miss the attack roll or the spell itself to be wasted. Then that creature is gone until the beginning of their next turn when it reappears back in the space where it disappeared from, or the closest unoccupied space. So this is a really neat spell. Uh, in some ways, this is like a counter spell, because we can counter an enemy spell. But in addition to that, we can also uh, target somebody who's making an attack roll. So it's not just a counter spell, it's a counter attack as well. Also, having an enemy disappear for a round can be useful as well, because during that round, they can't do things like counter spell themselves or do other reactions. Or if they're a legendary creature, they wouldn't be able to do things like legendary actions or layer actions. 
The problem with this spell is the wisdom saving throw. So that means if we are targeting a creature that is legendary, it could potentially use one of its legendary resistances to prevent this spell from working. But it's not all downsides compared to counterspell. Like I said, it can be used against attacks. Also, if a creature is using a higher level spell, Temporal Shunt doesn't care what level of spell is being cast. Now, the one thing I don't really get about this spell is the upcasting of this spell, because what this spell says is at higher levels, when you cast a spell using a spell slot of six level or higher, you can target one additional creature for each slot level above fifth. All targets must be within 30 feet of each other. So if we target another creature, I assume they vanish as well. Uh, do they vanish to the beginning of their next turn? Do they vanish to the beginning of the creature that we initially targets next turn? Is this really advantageous when we don't even know necessarily what that creature is being involved in? Do they make individual wisdom saving throws or does it depend on the wisdom saving throw of the initial creature? So there are some mechanics here with the upcasting that I think aren't entirely clear. But nevertheless, I think this is a reasonably good spell. I don't think it's quite as game changing as, say, counterspell. But I do think it is a good spell, even for a 5th level spell, and I would rank it green. That brings us into 6th level spells, and we have one 6th level spell, it's called Gravity Fissure. So this is a line spell, so it originates from you, and it goes up for 100 feet, and it's 5 feet wide. So basically, one line of squares in any direction you choose, 100 feet. Any creature in that line must make a constitution saving throw, take 8d8 force damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. That's terrible damage for a 6th level spell, let's start with that. Now, the big thing about this spell is each creature within 10 feet of the line, but not within it, must make a constitution saving throw, or take 8d8 force damage and be pulled towards the line until the creature's in the area. So we're taking all these creatures on either side of the line, and then yanking them towards the center and doing damage to them. Now note that if they make their saving throw and they weren't in the line to begin with, they take no damage and there's no effect. But the first thing we have to acknowledge is having it affect everything within 10 feet of the line on either side increases the area of effect of this spell by five times. So in terms of area of effect, this spell actually is huge. Basically 100 squares end up getting affected by this spell. Uh, the second thing is, is that we might find use of pulling all those creatures towards the center because then once they are all in a line we might set them up for another line spell for example. So let's say we had a uh, wizard with this spell and then they cast it and then they pull all these creatures towards the center and maybe they are allied with a blue dragon who's then going to go next and use their line breath weapon and then they're really going to decimate all these creatures. So this, again, could be a useful spell for setting up something else. But the 8d8 force damage, when we're talking about a 6th level spell, isn't up to snuff. We should be talking about 6th level spells doing about 10d8 points of damage. Also, this is a spell that is going to have friendly fire. So we're going to have to worry about potentially hitting allies with this spell. Now an evoker could potentially keep allies out of the area of this spell, but again, an Evoker doesn't necessarily have access to this spell. The Graviturgist doesn't have any way to protect allies from friendly fire spells. So as I said, this might be a useful spell for setting up something else. So I'm going to give it an orange rating. But in terms of a straight damage spell, the damage is below average for what we would expect for this level. So now we're going to get into our really high level spells. Uh, we're going to start with our 7th level spells. We have Tether Essence. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose two creatures we can see within 60 feet of us. They each make a constitution saving throw. That constitution saving throw is with disadvantage if they're within 30 feet of each other. And either creature can willingly fail the save. But if either of those saves succeeds, the spell has no effect. But if both saves fail, or they choose to fail, the creatures are magically linked for the duration, and the distance can change at that point, and it doesn't matter. Now this is a concentration saving throw, so concentration can be broken. Whenever one of them takes damage, the same damage is dealt to the other one. And if hit points are restored to one of them, then the same number of hit points are restored to the other one. Now if either of those tethered creatures drop to zero hit points, the spell ends. 
And this spell consumes a 250 gold piece component as well. So that's something else to keep in mind. This is not a cheap spell to cast. Now, my initial view of this spell was terrible. Two enemies make a saving throw with constitution. If either of them succeed, nothing happens with a 7th level spell. That is mind-blowingly awful. I don't like a spell at 7th level that's going to give one target a saving throw, and if they succeed, nothing happens. To give two targets a saving throw, and if either of them succeed, nothing happens, is absolutely awful. Now, if they're within 30 feet of each other, they do have disadvantage on that saving throw, but you give two enemies a constitution saving throw with disadvantage, there is a really good chance that one of them will succeed regardless. And so that is a huge gamble to be taking with a 7th level spell. Remember, this is the level that we get Force Cage, where we just win combats with no saving throw at all. But when I thought about it some more, there are some circumstantial uses to this spell. We might have an ally tethered to another ally, so that they can both benefit from some higher level healing spell, like a heal spell, for example. Or we might have an ally with maybe just a ton of hit points that tethers to an enemy and then takes damage themselves and the enemy shares that damage. But I think these are pretty few and far between. I think overall, I think the uses here are so circumstantial, I'm not even sure I can make this an orange spell. I think I really have to rank this a red spell because as an offensive spell, I think it's really bad. Being able to provide two saving throws, even if they're at disadvantage, at seventh level, and if either succeed, nothing happens, is just not where seventh level spells should be. And I think the uses of this spell where somebody's going to voluntarily fail their saving throw are few and far enough between that I don't see that even being a regularly happening circumstantial effect. So I think this spell is neat. It's a cool idea, but giving the enemies the ability to shrug off this spell with either of them making a save, it's just too much. Now we're gonna get into our eighth level spells. We have two eighth level spells to talk about. The first one is Dark Star. This is a 150 foot range spell, so pretty long range, concentration for one minute, constitution saving throw. What we do is we cast a spell and within range we create an effect with a sphere of a radius of up to 40 feet. Now a 40 foot radius sphere is huge, that's 80 feet across. For the duration of the spell, the area of the spell is difficult terrain and you can't see through it, it's magical darkness so even dark vision can't see through. Now what happens is any creature that enters the spell's area for the first time or they start their turn there, they make a constitution saving throw. They take 8d10 force damage on a failed save. That's not good damage for an 8th level spell. Or half as much damage on a successful one. Creature reduced to 0 hit points by this damage is disintegrated. So that's kind of significant if we're talking about creatures uh, that might be able to be raised from the dead, for example. Now, as I said, 8d10 force damage isn't 8th level spell kind of damage. Now, if we can have a creature affected by this for multiple rounds, then 16d10 damage, now suddenly we're talking 8th level worthy. And this is a huge area of effect and difficult terrain. So there may be cases where if we cast this and a creature is maybe in the middle, they might actually have to take multiple rounds to get out of this. But this is an 8th level spell. So that means we are at least 15th level to be casting this spell. So if we're taking on challenge rating 15 creatures, most of them are going to have either teleport effects or super high rates of travel uh, or some other way to get out of this much faster than that. I wouldn't count on getting many creatures of appropriate challenge rating in this for more than one round. And magical darkness, difficult terrain, these are useful effects when we're talking about third level, fourth level spells. But again, we're talking about an eighth level spell here. This is a really high level spell to be doing 80 10 damage, to be doing magical darkness, to be doing difficult terrain. And constitution saving throws are not the save we want to target. Now I should mention that casting a spell with a verbal component can't be done within the area. So this might be useful against something like a uh, mage, for example. But again, this is really high level spell. There's other ways we can deal with mages with lower level spells. I just think that this spell is pretty cool, but I think eighth level was probably too high a level for this spell. This spell should probably be about a sixth level spell. Uh, as an eighth level spell, I can't recommend it, and I need to give it a red ranking. 
The next eighth level spell I want to talk about is Reality Break. So Reality Break, we're going to choose one enemy within 60 feet and cast a spell. They're going to make a Wisdom Saving Throw. If they make their Wisdom Saving Throw, nothing happens. If they fail their Wisdom Saving Throw, they can't take reactions until the spell ends, and at the start of each of their turns, you can roll a d10 to determine what happens to them. Now, regardless what you roll on the d10, they're going to take a significant amount of damage, and then they might be stunned, they might fall prone, they might be blinded, and then at the end of their turn, they're going to get another saving throw. Now, what I have to say is, if we're going to make an 8th level spell, we cannot have it a spell where you target a single enemy, and if they make their save, nothing happens. We should be beyond that by 8th level. We are beyond that by 8th level, by multiple levels now. We have great 8th level spells that can take out an enemy without providing them a saving throw at all. We have the same thing with 7th level spells. We have the same thing with 5th level spells. At 8th level, targeting one enemy and giving them a saving throw, and if they succeed, nothing happens. That should not be happening. Creature's going to have legendary resistance. They're going to shrug off this spell. This is an 8th level spell. Uh, so this one is really disappointing for the level, and I give this a very strong red ranking. And now we get into our ninth level spells, and there's two ninth level spells to talk about. The first one is Ravenous Void. So this one has a really, really big range. It's a thousand foot range, uh, and it creates a 20 foot radius sphere. But the 20 foot radius sphere is a little deceptive because it's not a 20 foot radius sphere area of effect. Uh, it is much, much bigger than that. So we create a 20 foot radius sphere of destructive gravitational force and for the spell's duration, the sphere and any space within 100 feet of it are difficult terrain. And what happens is when the sphere appears and at the end of each of your turns until the spell ends, and the spell will last for up to one minute with concentration, any creature that starts within 100 feet of the sphere uh, must make a strength saving throw or they're pulled towards the sphere's center. And by pulled, I mean they go right to as close as possible to the middle of the sphere, so potentially up to 120 feet in one round. And a creature that enters the sphere for the first time or starts its turn there takes 5d10 force damage and they're restrained until they're no longer in the sphere. On their turn, they can use their action to make a strength check against your spell save DC, and if they succeed, they end the restrained condition. But they're still in the middle of this sphere. They've used their action already, so all they have now is their movement, and they have to move 120 feet in order to get out of this area of effect through difficult terrain, or they're going to make another strength saving throw, and if they fail, they're pulled right to the center and restrained again. So if we compare this to the 8th level spell Dark Star that had a somewhat similar effect, this is ramped up a lot. And when you read this spell for the first time, certainly when I read this spell for the first time, first thing I see is a 20-foot radius sphere, and I think that's a pretty small area of effect for a 9th level spell. But what you got to look at is it's not a 20-foot radius sphere area of effect. It is a 120-foot radius sphere area of effect, so 240 feet across. Now, 5d10 damage isn't a lot of damage for a 9th level spell. Restrained is in a great condition for this kind of spell. But then again, with this size of a spell, and with a spell that can potentially do the damage over and over again, this could be a potentially good spell for dealing with large amounts of fodder. Now, a CR20 creature isn't going to get caught by this spell. It's going to be able to teleport out, or it is going to be able to plane shift, or it is going to be able to enter the ethereal plane, or something like that, and get away from this spell. But if we have a huge amount of fodder, this could potentially deal with a lot of them. So overall, I think it is a reasonable spell for 9th level when dealing with a certain type of enemy. In other words, large numbers of fodder over a fairly large area of effect. So you want to have a significant effect on that enemy army marching towards you. This is a spell you could cast. So circumstantially useful, I'd say it's orange. So that brings us to our other ninth level spell, Time Ravage. So the way Time Ravage works is we're going to select one creature within 90 feet of us. Uh, and they are going to make a constitution saving throw, and they'll take 10d12 necrotic damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. Now, if the save fails, they also age to the point where they only have 30 days left before they die of old age. 
This gives them disadvantage on attack rolls, ability checks, saving throws, and half their walking speed. And they would need the Wish or a Greater Restoration cast with the 9th level slot to end the effect. And this will require a 5,000 gold piece component which the spell consumes. Now this spell, I would say, is one that is definitely giving Weird a run for its money for being the worst 9th level spell in the game. So for there to be a 9th level spell that provides a constitution saving throw, and if they make their constitution saving throw, they take half damage on 10d12, is ridiculous. There shouldn't be such a spell at 9th level. And let's keep in mind that even if they fail their saving throw, this isn't necessarily the end of the world. 10d12 damage with a 9th level spell is, I mean, it's a reasonable amount of damage. But we're probably talking about 65 points on a creature that might have 400 or more hit points. And then it gets disadvantage on a few things that it can restore with another spell cast. And yes, it will require a 9th level spell, but again, we're into 9th level spells. This is a 9th level spell. So this is not a spell that should be a 9th level spell. And a 5,000 gold piece component for what is already probably the worst ninth level spell in the game is just an insult. Uh, so this is definitely a very weak spell for ninth level and a strong red rating. So if I'm summing up the Dunamancy spells, what I would say is that when we look at the spells from cantrip level to fifth level, I'd say there's a lot of good stuff in there. Temporal Shunt, Magnify Gravity, Fortune's Favor, Gift of Clarity. These are spells that I would like to have on my wizard spell list. But when we get into the higher level spells, I think that the balance went a little bit off. We provided a few too many spells where you target a single creature or a couple creatures, they make their save, nothing happens. Or even in one case, an 8th level spell where you give two creatures a saving throw, and if either of them make them their save, nothing happens. That shouldn't be happening at those levels of spells. So I think what we ended up with is maybe a design team that wasn't used to high-level play and didn't really understand where the balance of those spells should be at that level. But when we get into the lower-level spells, lots of interesting spells that do neat things that I think are a unique addition to the game and a positive addition to the game. So those are the Dunamancy spells. What I want to talk about next week are the two new wizard subclasses. And then following that, I want to talk about there's a really neat fighter subclass I want to talk about. And there are some other uh, races and racial subtypes I want to talk about as well. So there's a few more weeks of talking about Explorer's Guide to Wildemount. Uh, so I hope you'll join me then. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers. Talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.